Me too. Gonna click it. Three watching. Okay. Are you sure? Uh, I'm pretty sure they can because I can hear us. Now they should be able to hear us. Are you sure you can't just hear me talking through your headphones? Yep. It's an echo. Now they should be able to hear us and see us. In theory. Hello. Hello, Vegeta and Victor. We're going to get started here in just a couple seconds. We're just trying to make sure we have everything set up because we've never done this before and it's really just trial by error. I think I fixed um, the delay a little bit. Okay. I hope, I hope there's less audio delay this time. I don't, I'm never going to be able to fix yours because yours is coming through two things. But Yeah. We don't even need to show my video necessarily, but we might as well keep it for now. <laughs> thanks, Victor. Yeah, uh, thanks. What, what do you mean you don't need to see your video? They want to see your face, Matt. I guess so. Give, give the people what they want. <laughs> All right, fine. Um, all right, I think, let me, because we have to record this for the podcast as well, so let me make sure we're doing that. Uh, Matt, give me some, some levels for me. I'm talking. This is the sound of my voice on TV. Is a reference <laughs> there for you? <laughs> I can't believe I've never made that joke before. It's not really a joke. It's more, of a, it's more of a reference. Yeah. Okay, you're good. I'm good. I think we're ready to go. So let's do this thing. Again, everyone listening out there um, on the stream, this is the first time we try to do something like this. So please, please be patient with us. We might have some problems as we go, and there might be some problems with the stream. Um, if anything's happening that is a little weird, um, if there's stuttering or something, let me know. Uh, refreshing should fix stuttering, but still let me know if it's happening, just because it helps. All right, Matt, are you clear on what we're going to do with this thing? I think so. I was going to open up the stuff yeah. real quick. I guess we should have broken up which we're going to read. We'll just alternate. We'll just wing it. Yeah. Are you going to do a, a fancy British accent? Of course. It'll be so bad. <laughs> uh, okay. That's not it. No, you are not in it. And we are we have slides that we're going to go through, guys. Um, we've pulled some quotes from the book as we talk about different areas, and we are going to, I think, send that slideshow out when we uh, when we publish the podcast for this. So if you want the slideshow, it'll be in the links for the show notes for that. So, and I'll probably say that again once we're actually recording. Yeah, I, I should have just saved that. <laughs> All right, I'm I'm ready. All right, me too. All right, so. We are recording, uh, we're live, and let's do this. So I'm gonna go in five, four, three, two, one. Hello and welcome to the first episode of the new and improved Daily Planet Book Club, our monthly live stream discussion of a book chosen by you, our listeners. My name is Scott Daly, one part of this magical book reading duo. The other part, why it's Matt Freeman, of course. He's right down there. Uh, Matt, how are you doing this fine Friday evening? I'm doing great, Scott. I'm excited to talk about this book with my good counterpart, Scott. <laughs> Excellent. And we are also here uh, with people in the chat room. We have uh, Victor here. Hello, Victor. We have Vegeta. We have Kifru. Is there anyone else in here that I haven't seen say hi yet? Um, if you don't want to say hi, you don't have to. Um, but we also have, I think there's some people in our Discord chat as well. So if you're listening from the Discord chat, 
uh, and you want to chat there, you can do that there too. Uh, we're, we're very happy to have you guys here. This month, we are here to talk to you all about Good Omens, the nice and accurate prophecies of Agnes Nutter, Witch, the 1990 comedy novel about the Christian end of the world as told by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. Uh, Matt, this is a book that won in our vote in a landslide. I think it was out of the five books, it was like something like 65% of the vote. So this was a very popular choice amongst our, our listeners. Um, and I guess I guess I understand why. Um, it's it's a pretty lighthearted, funny book. Yeah, it, it was fun. And, and I, I think it's going to make a good TV show, actually. I guess we'll, we'll talk about that specifically at, at yeah. some point. Yeah. So, so you, you hadn't read this book before? I had never read this book now. Um, Neither had I. And I think we're going to get into our histories with its authors. Um, I have never read a book by Terry Pratchett um, before. So this was this was my first Terry Pratchett experience. I know that's a big hole. Terry Pratchett has so many books, and I just never – I've never read any of the Discworld series. Um, I've read several of Neil Gaiman's books, uh, but this was, this was all new for me with Terry Pratchett. How about you? I, you know, I, I had read one Terry Pratchett book like when I was a kid, I think, and, and I had um, tried to figure out which one it was. Um, and the only thing I can really remember about it was that death was a character in it, which is apparently <laughs> not uh, very useful when trying to nail it down. Um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of had a sense of his of his kind of tone that, that he that he uses and that he uses again in this book. Um, and and like you, I think you and I have read a lot of the same uh, Neil Neil Gaiman books, um, including American Gods, which has some similarities to this book. Yeah, I think one of the things we're going to get into is. You know, we're both coming from a place where we're pretty not knowledgeable of Terry Pratchett, but there are parts of this that feel very Neil Gaiman, and then there are parts of it that don't, which I'm assuming are, are the Terry Pratchetty parts. But this this book was written in, in, in 1990. Um, I think it started in like 85, and they wrote it back and forth over the course of the next five years. But um, American Gods comes out, and I, I think it was 2000, 2001. I think was about the time when American Gods was published. Um, so you can you can kind of look at this book as Neil Gaiman like sifting through some of some of his ideas on on belief, on gods, on the power of believing in those gods and and or or lack thereof. And a, a, a thought that he'll go into in a lot more detail when he writes his own novel. Yeah, right. It's specifically the idea of like personifications of. Um, forces or or of um belief yeah that's yeah. that's something we see here definitely yeah so uh, before we get into talking about the book proper i think one of the things we just want to talk about was just the general concept of co-writing a novel um like i said i think uh, neil gaiman had this idea didn't know how to end it came to terry pratchett with it terry pratchett liked it didn't know how to end it either and then they started talking and the talking turned into writing um, I think Gaiman admits that Pratchett probably did more of the writing, but that when you get into this idea where you're both writing at the same time, you spend like three hours in a, in a writing session, um, and one person might be actually transcribing what you're saying, but the mix of who's doing what gets really blurred. Have you, have you in your writing experiences ever tried to co-write a short story or a novel or, or something of that sort. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, me and Michael tr would try to co-write things from time to time. And, and it was usually, um, um, very much like, like what you just said. Um, it was always very difficult to ever remember who had had any particular idea. Um, so, so that, that was one thing where, where it's, it's almost like it, there is no such thing as one person, ha one person having an idea because, it's uh, it's almost like the uh, the McElroy's podcast where where it's more like everyone's riffing and and it's like who has ownership of that no one really um, and then you know you you and I and 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 Michael also have have collaborated on a on a thing together so you you, you probably kind of know what I'm talking about a little bit yeah yeah I mean there there's always like and, and this this concept happens in in TV a lot too where um, the writer's room will sit down and break an episode but one person will be in charge of actually you know putting hands to keys and getting the script out there and i think it seems like that's what happened here where um maybe the, the prose itself is more pratchety but a lot of the ideas certain certainly feel very neil gaiman -y. and it's a very interesting experience i am 
I think Neil Gaiman really hadn't written an, a, a novel before this moment, um, yeah. before this book. So uh, this, I guess this was kind of a great crash course into, into novel writing for him. Yeah, and I think Pratchett did kind of have the steering wheel. Like, I think he, he was in charge of the master copy, in, in, in his own words. Um, and he wrote most of the most of the words and, and all of that. But, but yeah, but it's you definitely see, see Gaiman's fingerprints all over it. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> Kifru was very shocked at our... Um, lack of of reading Terry Pratchett. At least that's what I'm assuming the multiple exclamation points are. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's get into the book. Let's talk about the book. Let's talk very broadly first. Um, let's talk what what did you think overall about the novel, um, and then we'll, we'll get into the details a little bit. Yeah. Well, first, and this is probably not exactly what you meant, but I I love the audiobook reading. In particular, I thought the voice actor, who I believe is is named Martin Jarvis, was was amazing, um, and that really, if anything, increased my enjoyment of, of this uh, of this material because like you immediately get a sense for the characters based on how he chooses to read them. Um, um, so I, 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 the level in which I enjoyed this novel was almost as like a long, or I should say, the level in which I most enjoyed this novel was as like a a a long series of enjoyable vignettes um okay. like like it was almost episodic in its nature and in, in that uh it would sort of jump from section to section and each section is almost its own little little sub story that's 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 very like witty and entertaining and funny and and yeah and lighthearted, like you said um um yeah well how about you yeah um i like i like that you listen to the audiobook because i always like like comedic timing and comedy is always so important um, that when you have a book that's specifically trying to be very funny like this, I feel like the audiobook would enhance it more than, than anything else. Um, I, I went back and forth on this book. I really did. Uh, when I first started reading it, I really liked it. Um, I was really enjoying myself. I was having a lot of fun, but then we got to the end of it and I was like, eh, I think I texted you right after I read it. And I was like, eh, and then the, the, the preparation I was doing for this podcast, I kind of started liking it again. Um, I kind of, we got into really, you know, parsing through and thinking about the themes and what the book is doing and, and how the book is doing it. And as much as there are parts of it that I definitely feel that uh, could have been a little better, could have been tighter, could have been more interesting. Um, I, I, I think it's one of those books that's maybe more fun to talk about or, and to study than it is to read. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and I wonder if some of this had to do with the fact that it was co-written, but I, I feel like if I were, I don't, I don't have a paper copy, but if I were to metaphorically pick it up and open to any page, I would be like, oh yes, this part, I remember this, this was delightful. Um, but I still walked yeah. away from like the the book as a whole with a sense of like, well, that didn't quite come together. Um, and, and what I mean, and, and I guess, I guess we can start getting into what exactly we think think caused that and, and what, yeah. what, I, what I think caused that is that the book r- really has no protagonist um, the, the you could argue that that two of the central characters are Aziraphale and Crowley Crowley um, but they don't and, and they, they have their own arcs to be sure but that their actions don't really accomplish anything like it's almost like yes. but by definition in the story their actions accomplish nothing that's kind of the point actually yeah um and then there are other side characters who you might be tempted to place the mantle of protagonist on but none of them i would argue quite fit entirely like you don't meet adam until significantly late into the story um right. and, and so I'm not somebody who's going to say every story needs to have like one concrete protagonist. That's just one way of doing storytelling. But yeah. it, it, it does turn out that if you if you don't have a protagonist, it's a lot easier to kind of anchor um, the the drama uh, in, in a way where it, it hits when it's supposed to hit. Yeah, and I think I think you're absolutely right that, that from a pure like traditional story structure place. Adam would be the protagonist because Adam is the most active character in the story. He's the one making decisions and doing things that impact everything. But you're right. We don't meet him till very late in the film and we don't, wow, that's very loud. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then uh, we, you're right. The other characters, you know, and and that's, and, and we'll get into the themes. We'll get into the points. It is, it is the point of the novel that the things that everyone else in the book are doing 
have no effect on anything because one of the main points is is this idea of prophecies, this idea of living your life as if according to something that is written down is just kind of bullshit and the wrong way to do things and things are always going to happen different from that kind of stuff. So by definition, by the point of the book, these characters can't impact anything or it would break down that theme. So like I get I get why it happened, but I think you're right that that you know, we have these these two main characters and and these two duality characters of of the, the angel and the demon that are best friends and you wanted to see them have more of an impact on the story. And I just I agree with you that I felt like they just didn't. And yeah. and that 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 I think that prevented the the ending from landing in a way that I wanted it to. Yeah. I, I did feel like you could see coming the fact that they weren't going to have any impact because, and and we can get into the details of this, but like, I, I, I feel like it was telegraphed early on that their influence largely just cancels each other out. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, and, certain certain books you just have to kind of take on their own merits i think right. and this one like i i i'm I, i'm like okay well the point here was to tell these this this the story is more in like the getting there than the resolution because the resolution doesn't really depend on all those things and it's almost just it's about the struggles of these people even if they don't end up mattering to the plot yeah and i think you can kind of understand when you hear that gaiman says uh, I have this idea, but I don't have an ending. And you, I, I hear that quote, and I'm like, well, I understand why now, because your ending is kind of... Uh, and then nobody does anything, and that means that everyone wins. Yeah. And, like, and it's, it's thematically rich and thematically satisfying, but not narratively satisfying yeah makes sense. that's exactly how i would phrase it yeah um and, and then and it's, it's funny because like you say like the more i reflect on it the more i'm I like appreciate its abstract beauty even though like in the moment of reading it i was i was a little bit let down by the the like right. feeling of you know huh okay and like i did exactly what you were talking about today is i was just flipping through the book as i prepped like as a way to structure our conversation i was looking for quotes i was looking for parts of the book that reflect the themes and i would turn to a random page and it was like oh yeah this is this delightful moment that happens on this page where these characters are playing off each other and the dialogue is really sharp and the prose is is quick and funny and i enjoyed everything in there but yeah when you when you think about you know i guess the the 300 foot level of that narrative structure when you break those little vignettes out of their solitary container and look at them as part of the bigger whole that's i think where the problems of the book come out yeah um, yeah I, I don't know if it could be fixed is the thing because like you said it's like that's the, the, that is the theme and so you can't change it so that like oh no we changed it and now and now zero fail and, and curly both have some really important role in how things turn out because by definition, yeah, that they would shouldn't. Ruin, yeah, yeah, that would ruin what they're trying to say. So I guess that's that's kind of a weird criticism, and like, and 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 I guess that's why I partially don't even really mean it as a criticism because yeah, I like maybe it's just this is the way this book works. Yeah. So it's not like it's it's not like I'm saying you should have done this. You should have made Crowley your main character. You should have followed him throughout the story, and he has agency and he has um, choices that are impacting the plot. Um, but that, that ruins, that ruins everything. Yeah. I think it's less of a criticism that we're making and more of a diagnosis of why we felt about the ending the way we did. I think that's very fair. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's dive into it then. We've, we've kind of been hovering around these topics for a bit, but I want to talk about, uh, a Crowley and Aziraphil. Is that how you pronounce his name? I was uh, saying Azraphil in my head, but that's probably wrong. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the voice actor said Crowley. Which oh, really? the, the American pronunciation is Crowley, yeah. and, and so that's and then a zero fail. Very British. Yeah, um, and and a zero fail is is the way um the way the the voice actor said it. So uh, that's the way I'm going to say it. All right. Well, in our podcast, we generally use whatever the audiobook says <laughs> as the Bible. So we're going to do that again yeah. tonight. Um, yeah. So I I think uh, let me get to the slides. Um, one of the things that I really liked about these two characters is, is, like you said, how they play off each other. And and one of the things you pointed out to me was this 
kind of two beat with the guns um, where uh, near the beginning of the book, Aziraphil is uh, at Warlock, who they think is the Antichrist's party, and the kids get a hold of real guns from the security guards, which he changes to water guns. And then that's echoed later in the book where Crowley um, like changes paintball guns into real guns to drive people crazy. And, and I think that fits into what you were talking about with that kind of them just uh, like balancing each other out and, and crossing each other out. Um, and, and this uh, quote that I pull right here is, is kind of this, this, the book, I think the book is more harsh on the light side than it is on the dark side um, in that it's, it's seeming that like the dark side is at least aware that they are doing bad. Whereas the light side is seemingly hypocritical at every pass. Yeah. And I think this is kind of an example of that. And I don't know if do you, if you want to read this first one or I can. Sure. Yeah. This is a very odd gun, you know, very strange. I thought your side disapproved of guns said Crowley. <laughs> he took the gun from the angel's plump hand and sighted along the stubby barrel. Current thinking favors them, said Aziraphale. They lend weight to moral arguments, in the right hands, of course. Yeah? Crowley snaked a hand over the metal. That's all right, and come on. Yeah, I really I really like this. Um, yeah. I think, and, and the reason I pulled this quote in particular is because I think it does a few things very well. It shows that general, hip, uh, the, that general hypocritical nature of things, but, like, the the... the the phrasing of current thinking favors them, which is like you have what is supposed to represent the the uh, infallible, ineffable um, God side of things where they know all and they have this grand plan. But they're also talking about current thinking as if the feeling on guns amongst the angels has shifted <laughs> over the course of the, the, the centuries, which doesn't really make a lot of sense uh, when you compare it to what they're supposed to represent. Um, so it's just this really fun moment. And then I like, of course, like the detail of, of uh, Aziraphale's plump hands and how Crowley snaked a hand yeah. over the metal. Like there's a lot of really subtle um, indications of, of reminding us of them and, and their, tr their true nature that, that goes on in this. And it's just a really fabulous quote. I think it reflects things a lot. Yeah, it took me several beats too long to realize that Crowley was the snake from the Garden of Eden. Like, I mean, it, it should have. It, his name changed because it, well, well, it changed from Crawley to Crowley. So, <laughs> but but since it's pretty pretty hidden there. Yeah, well, since I wasn't actually reading it, I imagine. See, that's why it's not because I'm dumb. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I think I think this this is a beat that goes on. Um, we have a, a thing where we're talking about terrorists, where both there's a point later in the book where both uh, Crowley and and Aziraphale are talking about um, whether it was their side that was responsible for something. And I think Crowley says, "Well, could it have been? Or what's going to end the world?" And he says, "Terrorists." And he's like, Crowley says, "Not on my side." And Aziraphale says, "Not on mine." Of course, we call them freedom fighters. Right. And it's just this like. Like I think Gaiman and Pratchett are, are very harsh. Um, I, I don't, I don't think this is a book that's specifically attacking the idea of religion itself or or spirituality itself or the existence of God. Um, I think this is a book very much um, insulting the uh, the kind of dogmatic belief and structured belief in these kind of systems um, and because it's very easy to take shots um they're taking these shots on these on the angel side of these things a lot yeah right i mean it's interesting maybe this is a bit of a tangent but that there the the theology that's kind of underpinning all this is interesting because it's almost implying um or i think it is implying frankly that that both the angel the, the angelic and the demonic like sides are actually just all part of the ineffable plan. So, so in other words, like right. the the Godhead is is you know one you know unity, and the demons are like one hand, and the and the angels are the other, and um and it's all kind of the 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 purpose of it is actually to to obtain this balance that that is kind of what we see by the end, um, right. and it's not the purpose is not for one side to beat the other, um yeah. But and I think that is that is perfectly encapsulated by the fact that both um, 
the the prince of hell and the voice of God at the end of the book are pleading with the Antichrist to bring about the end of the world. Yeah. Um, and I think we'll get into this, but it's not for any other reason than it was written that this was supposed to happen. So, yeah. so we're going to do it. So we're, we're going to get into inevitability because that's, I think that word is used like 30 times throughout the book. Mm-hmm. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. Vegeta just said that uh, he really likes how when uh, Crowley and Aziraphale compares the list of terrorist freedom fighters that work for each other, they discover that uh, about half of them are on both lists. And yeah. That's, that's a really good point. Um, it is, it is very funny that, that it, it shows just how two sides of the same coin these guys are, that even the people that they have working for them are really just the same people, um, including our, our witch hunter friend. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it's also not only in like a real, in, in like a religious light, but in just like a, what is the nature of good and evil sense? Um, it's, it's asking some interesting questions. I, I think I'll, I'll get into that more a couple of quotes from now. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this next quote that we have up here on the page though, um, we're talking about uh, the the light side's opinion of evil, and I really like this quote because, well, first of all, it's it's Crowley's response to it is hilarious, but it does kind of end up being prophetic a little bit. Um, and th- this is in reference, I think, this is when they realize that the the switch happened, that the the babies were mixed up while at the hospital. Um, I'll read this one, Matt, in my my finest English accent. Okay. I don't actually have a good English accent. Just heads up. You see, evil always contains the seeds of its own destruction, said the angel. (laughs) It is ultimately negative, and therefore, I think I've changed like six different accents throughout the course of this, (laughs) and therefore encompasses its downfall even at the moments of apparent triumph. No matter how grandiose, how well planned, how apparently foolproof an evil plan, inherent sinfulness will by definition rebound upon its instigators. No matter how apparently successful it may seem upon the way, at the end, it will wreck itself. It will founder upon the rocks of inequity and sink headfirst, vanish without a trace into the seas of oblivion. Crowley considered this. Nah, he said at last. For my money, it was just average incompetence. And I just... They're both kind of right. <laughs> yeah. And and it's like... the like These characters are so different while simultaneously being this, the same. And I think this quote pulls us out very well because you have Aziraphale go on for a huge paragraph talking about, and he basically repeats himself. Like he's saying the same thing kind of twice throughout this. And it wasn't until I read it out loud there. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, sorry, I just saw what Kiefer said yeah. in chat while I was talking. Um, yeah, but he, he's, he's basically repeating himself. He's saying uh, like s- several times being sinful by itself is what causes things to go wrong so you can't make plans um and then and then crowley comes back with just a short like five word response that says no it's just average incompetence and he is right because the way the switch happened was just this woman was not paying attention and people were trying to communicate to each other via looks that's a really good beat that i enjoy at the beginning of the book when the they're explaining what the nods and what the eye looks mean yeah interpreted by one person as interpreted by the other and that's the thing like that's the thing about this book is when you think of those individual beats, I'm like, oh my God, that was so great and so fun to read. But, but then when I think of the book as a whole, my opinion is much more negative. And it, it's like, that's something that I'm just having trouble parsing through. And I think it's for the reasons that we've already talked about. Yeah. So the, I guess I can use this to, to talk for a little bit about what I meant about like good and evil, which is that like, there's, there's like a certain level of, of self-awareness and freedom that, that Crowley has, like, like, there's a there's a point where, like, it's showing both um, Aziraphale and Crowley's responses to learning that the apocalypse is coming, and both of them are really bummed because they both have like basically fallen in love with the world and and worldly things, um, which I think is one of the more powerful kind of things in the story is like this this angel and demon are both equally crushed uh, about the 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 imminent death of the world, and 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 Aziraphale is just sort of like listlessly gonna just do what he has to do but eventually Crowley is more or less like well what's the point of you know being bad if you can't disobey your boss even if your boss is satan um <laughs> I, I don't remember exactly how he kind of thinks that out to himself but that was what i that was kind of my takeaway from it was like it, 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 the 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 nature of of like evil was not being um 
it, it was almost like the story was pointing out that there are, are benefits to both sides of, of to, to, to both ways of seeing things, I guess. Um, it, yeah. 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 And I think that's kind of reflect like throughout this entire book, Crowley is specifically disobeying orders. And there are several beats where he's contacted from hell and, and they're yelling at him. Um, there's even uh, that, that small section where one of the princes uh, comes after him and he traps him in a phone yeah. at, at a, a, a call line, which again is hilarious. But yeah, there's this idea that like not like that evil allows you a, a, a freedom to not listen to things that you don't agree with. And because and, that's what he's doing the entire time. And it's a, a bit ironic that he's getting yelled at by his superiors for not listening to him when like breaking rules is what he's supposed to be doing. And, and there's a little just contradiction on its own there. Yeah. You just reminded me that this is a book about the apocalypse in which almost no one dies except for all the employees at a call center. (laughs) Yeah. But they say that that's a good thing that the universe as a whole was improved by it. Yeah. Even even the, by the, the terrible demon uh, killing everyone at a call center, he actually made the world a better place. Yeah, right. Which is hilarious, and I, imag- I imagine Terry Pratchett was interrupted by telemarketers one too many times while while, while writing. <laughs> You're probably right. Yeah. So uh, moving on from those two characters, and I think we're going to come back to them um, as we get to the ending, and and all this kind of wraps up. But I wanted to talk about Newt. A little bit because Newt is a character that comes in, you know, probably halfway through the story and is the most like uh, audience surrogate character. Um, He is out of everyone in this book, the only normal one. Like he's not an angel. He's not a demon. He's not uh, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, He's not uh, the descendant of a long line of people who make perfect prophecies. He's just a guy who's lost in the world and... I I wrote down, I, I pulled this quote. This is a very long one if you want to try to read it all. But I think it's it just like this great job that, that Pratchett did to really just get you to understand this guy immediately. Sure. Um, I will not do it in an accent because there's no dialogue in it. But Okay. That's um, a good excuse. Okay. Newt Pulsifer had never had a cause in his life, nor had he, as far as he knew, ever believed in anything It had been embarrassing because he quite wanted to believe in something since he recognized that belief was the life belt that got most people through the choppy waters of life. He'd have liked to believe in the supreme God, although he'd have preferred to have a half hour's chat with him before committing himself to clear up one or two points. He'd sat in all sorts of churches waiting for that single flash of blue light and it hadn't come. And then he'd, then he'd try to become an official atheist and hadn't gotten the rock hard self-satisfied strength of belief even for that. And every single political party had seemed to him equally dishonest. Then he'd tried believing in the universe, which seemed sound enough, until he'd innocently started reading new books with words like chaos and time and quantum in the titles. He'd found that even the people whose job of work was, so to speak, the universe, didn't really believe in it and were actually quite proud of not knowing what it really was or even if it could theoretically exist. This is how Newton Pulsifer looked as a man. If he went into a phone booth and changed, he might manage to come out looking like Clark Kent. (laughs) That's such a great way to end that. I loved that so much. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And and this this is kind of like this book operates in dualities a lot. Um, You have you have Crowley and Aziraphale. um, You have Adam and his three people of them. And they kind of operate in opposed to the four horsemen. And then you have Newt. And you have uh, Anathema. How do you, how do you say that? Am I saying that right? So I, I see now that it's spelled weird, but the, the voice actor just said it, Anathema, like like the word Anathema. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, I think that's actually what it is, and I probably just spelled it wrong on the Oh, paper. okay. All right. Um, <laughs> and yeah, that's probably why I said it wrong, too. Yeah, so Anathema is this person who um, has had this book with her her entire life and has plotted every single thing she does, and everywhere she goes... Uh, everything she believes in off of this book of prophecies by by Agnes Nutter. Um, Newt, on the other hand, which is very clearly showed here, is a character who has never believed in anything, has been lost and aimless his entire life, and has just been tr- looking for something to believe in, someone to believe in. And, and of course, these two characters eventually meet up, and, and 
go on their own adventure that leads into everything that happens at the end of this book, but quite independently as well. They're, they're kind of off doing their own thing, and then they just happen to show up at an opportune time. Yeah. But, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just trying to think if I can draw any meaning out of, because his name is actually Newton, um, as in the physicist, and, and anathema obviously means like the the antithesis of something trying to figure out if yeah. there's any if there's any like meaning there uh, there probably is I, I i can't parse it on the fly i just noticed this so i had to blurt it out sorry no yeah no i think i think you're right and and that definitely means something and if anyone listening has any idea i'd love to hear it but there there is like there is this like there, this they find each other and the book ends with a kind of middle ground between them. And I think that's what we see again and again is that we have these two extremes and they kind of meet in the middle and neither side goes away per se, but both are fundamentally changed in some way. Um, and we see that with the two of them. I think, it, and in my interpretation of the end, when we see Agnes Nutter's um, face like appear in the smoke that, that comes out of the chimney of the house is that they burned the, the second book of prophecies that they got um, kind of signifying a release from, from living your life according to what this prophecy says. And like, so I, I think Newt has found something in, in Anathema and she has stopped living according to this thing. And I just love how these two characters play off each other. And I really love this quote because it just, God, it's, it's a perfect way of defining someone who's just lost and doesn't know what to believe in. And it's so fitting that Neil Gaiman was, was part of this because the idea of belief, the idea of searching for something to believe in and the importance of belief and what belief can do for you, good and bad, is like what American Gods is entirely about. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see in this character him mulling over those ideas. Yeah, I know what you mean. All right, so let's go on to Adam, our protagonist. <laughs> Um, the Antichrist. Yeah, just just the Antichrist and and his group and and I am kind of fascinated by this character because like the way the book works is you're like you're seeing him get worse and worse as he go like he doesn't start off as a good person like it, when I first read what was going to happen in this book when I saw where the, where the book was going I thought it would be very um, interesting if they would say that the Antichrist himself is raised in this perfectly normal household and becomes like a perfect child. But that's not what they did at all. He's Adam is kind of a mischievous jerk who like everyone in the neighborhood doesn't like. He's bosses around his group. Um, he, but, but as I think the book says, there's something fundamentally human about that. There's something that is just, he is like the embodiment of humanity and that he's not always good. Um, but he's not always bad either, and he just wants to, like, live and enjoy life and boss around his group of people, which even that is a little too hard for him. I like the line where he's like, you want me to run the whole world? I can barely keep up with telling these three people what to do. Um, but he, he's a really, really fun character, and I, I kind of wish maybe we introduced him a little earlier. Maybe we got to be with him a little more before things started getting really crazy. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, um, as far as... As far as his character in general, I, I think you are supposed to be wondering about him. Like, like he could go either way, um, and and he just comes across as a really realistic like kid of his age with with no particular moral bent whatsoever, which I think is is very normal. Um, in terms of whether he would whether we would have benefited from meeting him earlier, um, I I almost I almost wonder like I almost want to say this is a case where the less you know about him, the, the better, like, like either if, if I were writing this and I'm not saying like, this is what they should fix. Cause it would be better. I'm just saying like my instinct, if I were writing this would have been to either make him more central and introduce him earlier and have more scenes with him, um, and get to know him better or to make his role even more minimal to the point where you almost don't know anything about him. And, and so, everything you learn about him toward the end comes as a surprise. Um, but yeah, I, I see what you mean. Um, cause, cause we, I can't, I, I don't have it on the top of my head, but there's really very few, very few scenes with 
with him at all before before the the apocalypse right right yeah um it's just i think like a base scene of just like the dog comes to him i love i love the, the beats with the dog though the idea that the dog is representative of, of this change in him where it slowly stops becoming a hellhound and starts becoming a little tiny puppy and loses um all the the desire of of evil within him as a great way of, of showing what adam is um yeah adam is just a person just like the dog ends up just being a dog yeah and wanting to do dog things right well i think like adam and the dog both become in love with the world just yeah. the, just the way the angel and the demon did and and that's why ultimately adam decides to just preserve it uh, Vegeta in the chat says that uh, the power and nature of belief is also one of the classic themes that Pratchett touches upon more than once. Um, that that doesn't surprise me. Um, again, I haven't read any any of his work, but it, there was probably something in this story when when Gaiman first approached him with it that he liked and latched onto. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, Kifu uh, comments on on the fact that of course his name is Adam. That is very fitting. Um, with the, the biblical story and we're going to get into how the story ends how Ad, Adam's last thoughts of the story and how perfectly fitting and kind of full circle they are um, to, the, to the story of creation and the Garden of Eden yeah um, yeah. so I, I wanted we have this, this thing that's up on the slide right now um, talking about Adam and his, his them and their kind of final confrontation with the four horsemen here and I really like this, so I wanted I wanted to touch on it, and I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna try to do. How did you How did you interpret D- Death's voice? Because yeah, well the 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 audiobook reader just says like it's just kind of a deep like it has been done would be kind of yeah. my approximation. I, I kind of read Death as this kind of like he speaks very properly but very loudly. Um, yeah, I basically synthesize like a totally unpronounceable like hell voice in in my head when I do it. So <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to read this one. It has been done, said Death. He leaned forward a little and stared eyelessly at Adam. It was hard to tell if he was surprised. Yes, well, said Adam. The thing is, I don't want it done. I never asked for it to be done. Death looked at the other three and then back to Adam. I do not understand, he said. Surely your very existence requires the ending of the world. It is written. I don't see why anyone has to go on and write things like that, said Adam calmly. The world is full of all sorts of brilliant stuff, and I haven't found out about all of it yet, so I don't want anyone messing it about or ending it before I've had a chance to find out about it. So you can all just go away. (laughs) And, like, we're going to get into this idea of the fundamental rejection of things being written, but this is is the moment where where Adam makes his first choice in a long line of choices that are going to lead to him... Uh, fixing everything and putting the world back the way it's supposed to be or his version of it as we'll see he doesn't do quite perfect but um i i really enjoy this and i actually it continues on in this next one because the the response of the, the horsemen are just like they don't know what to do and the idea that when you live your life so according to what the plan is or or this great unknowable plan that you live to the plan, even though you don't understand what the plan is or why it is, that you just cannot process the idea that someone is not going to follow that plan. And I really, I really like this. Um, so it goes, death stared at Adam. You are part of us, said War, between teeth like beautiful bullets, which is great, great imagery. Yeah. It is done. We make the world anew said Pollution, his voice as insidious as something leaking out of a corroded drum into a water table. You lead us, said Famine. And Adam hesitated. Voices inside inside him still cried out that this was true, and that the world was his as well, and all he had to do was turn and lead them out across a bewildered planet. They were his kind of people. In tears above, the hosts of the sky waited for the word. Dog began to growl. Adam looked at them. They were his kind of people, too. You just had to decide who your friends were, really were. And that's like, that gets to the whole duality of everything that while Adam is part demon and part angel, he is also a human. He is a person. And his group, his group of three, is the ones he chooses to lead. And, and it gets to that, that idea of choice and 
in, with f when free will exists, and this is when I, w when I struggle with religion and spirituality in real life, the idea that you can have both free will and a great plan never really jived with me. I don't understand how those two things can exist at the same time. And this is kind of precisely pointing out that you can't, that as long as, as long as there's free will, as long as there's choice, nothing is going to happen um, the way it is written or, or supposed, I guess. Yeah. Um, the, the, you know, I think it, like it's, it, it's interesting because he's, it, it's like a very different take on, on the concept of the antichrist from, from what is usual because um, the, the, the original Christ um, s saves the world by sacrificing or, or, or he saves humanity by, by sacrificing his life. And this, 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 you know, antipode of Christ, whatever it's, this isn't the, the evil Christ. This is just, this is like the, a, a different savior, essentially along a different axis. He's, he's, choo he's again, he, he is again, just like Christ choosing to save the world. Um, for, for different reasons and in, in a different way. And, and I think that's, that's an interesting take on, on the idea of the antichrist. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it makes you wonder like what, what it would have looked like, what, what Gaiman and Pratchett's version of the antichrist would have looked like if he had been, if, if things had going, gone according to the grand plan, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which, which kind of naturally moves us into the horsemen. And I, I want to talk to you about the horsemen and what you thought of them, because on the one hand, I love how they're introduced. I love the idea that we just meet these people as just like random people that exist in the world. And it isn't until later that it becomes very clear what they are. Um, we meet war as just a woman traveling in a, uh, in, in a, a small African island, I think, or a small African, African country um, where there's never been any war. No one has ever, nothing has ever happened. And then suddenly... Um, by by two days later, everyone's dead. We meet Famine, who is this corporate leader in charge of a dieting plan that includes not eating any food ever. Um, pollution is just like going around making as much mess as possible. And then, of course, death itself is everywhere, is everything. It's kind of the least characterized because it's the most widespread and, and um, amorphous of, of the four of them. And so what what did you think? Did you did you like these guys? Did you like their their purpose and their point within the novel? I mean, I, I felt about them similar to how I felt about Azir Fail and, and Crowley in, in the end was was I was like, well, that was there were a lot of neat little vignettes on the way here that were all independently enjoyable, but in the end, their contribution to the plot is like net zero. Um, like they they yeah. they start the apocalypse and then the apocalypse is is averted by. Um, I think I think you pointed out earlier. It's like it, there's actually some ambiguity as to whether it's <laughs> it's actually successfully averted by Newt or whether it's just Adam like imposing his will on the world and and stopping it. Yeah, yeah, because like Newt just kind of touches the computer, um, but at, well, we know that Adam has the ability to just whatever he thinks, and and right before we switch over to Newt doing all that stuff, we have Adam basically saying everything they do um, is going to be undone now. So um, that that kind of removes newt's entire contribution to the plot as well um but uh, yeah i i don't know i don't know the, the proper way to read that yeah i also wanted to bring up like i wasn't sure how to read this but aziraphale gives the flaming sword to the original adam when he leaves the garden of eden and and he's like i i gave it to him because i wanted him to be able to protect himself or something like that and then the flaming sword turns out to be almost the not the personification that's wrong, but, but like it, it turns out to be involved with war. Um, I think it is literally the sword that war. Yeah. It's it, it, it I think Aziraphale specifically mentions, Oh, I haven't seen that in a long time. As yeah. If that, that was his very sword. And yeah, that is the, 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 uh, yeah, I, I'm searching for the word too. And I don't know what it is. The symbol of war. Right. Um, so, so is it implied that, that like the angel, the, the good side gave mankind, the, the the desire for strife by giving them the concept of protecting themselves something like that maybe yeah i i, I would think i think so i mean i think there's definitely a purpose to the fact that that it is specifically mentioned that that it is given by aziraphale and he sees it again and wields it again um near the end of the story um and, and like the the 
the beat about these horsemen is that even when they are defeated, the, where they hide back in is in side men again. Like that these are not like as, as far as the grand plan goes and, and the battle of good versus evil, the, the horsemen themselves are just in physical embodiments of the desires and the things inside mankind. So when, when Adam and them defeat them, they just go back in people and they, they're not going away. Like this, the end of this book is not, the world is fixed and everyone's going to be happy now. Like the idea that if the, if they stop, if the, the angels and the demons stop messing with people, then they're just going to be good is not what, what I think the book is saying at all is that yeah. they're still going to be, they're going to be good and they're going to be bad and they're going to be cruel and terrible to each other, but they're also going to be nice to each other. And, and the world is going to carry on much in the way it always has that, that this idea that we have to influence them one way or the other is kind of a misnomer because we do that ourselves. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you, you essentially sacrifice any capacity to make choices. If you're all good or, or all evil, you just always make the good choice or you always make the evil choice. Yeah. And it's a whole lot less fun. Yeah. Yeah. So that gets us, I think, to the ending and the, the main theme of ineffability here and the hilarious way in which this this theme is discussed. Um, my I think I think I have it here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this slide um, and this slide actually goes on to the next page as well, because it was a very long quote. But I, I wanted to get to it because we're talking here about like. The, the the subtitle of this book is The Nice and Accurate Prophecies of Agnes Nutter Witch. So one of the main core things that we're doing here is talking about the idea of prophecies, the idea of plans, the idea of writing down and predicting the future and how things have to happen because um, it says so. And there's almost two kinds of prophecies in this book, right? There, there are the prophecies that happen only because we've read them and therefore do them. Why, why did Newt and Anathema... Uh, hook up because it's said in the prophecy that they were supposed to do that. Um, and then there's the other kind, which are many of Agnes and others, which can only be understood after the fact. So you mm -hmm. kind of, you kind of fit the peg into the hole a little bit there. It's like, Oh yeah, here's where it was talking about that. Um, but the idea that a plan can be ineffable and understood is contrary. And I think that's what this quote really gets into. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll do this one. Sure. Yes, yes, that's the great plan, all right, said Aziraphale. He spoke politely and respectfully, but with the air of one who had just asked an unwelcome question at a political meeting and won't go away until he gets an answer. I was just asking if it's an ineffable as well. I just want to clear. I just want to be clear on one point. It doesn't matter, snapped the Metatron. It's the same thing, surely. Surely, thought Crowley. They don't actually know. He started to grin like an idiot. S so you're not 100% clear on this, said Aziraphale. It's not given to us to understand the ineffable plan, said the Metatron. But of course the great plan... But the great plan can only be part of the tiny... Uh, can only be a tiny part of the ov over... Yeah. <laughs> but the great plan can only be a tiny part of the overall ineffability, said Crowley. You can't be certain that that's what's that what's happening right now isn't exactly right from an, an, an ineffable point of view. It is written, Bellow deals above. <laughs> I was not prepared for that. <laughs> but it might be written differently somewhere else, said Crowley. Well, you can't read it. In bigger letters, said Aziraphale. Underlined, Crowley added. Twice, suggested Aziraphale. Sorry, my eyes were uh, were abandoning me in the middle of that. No, and, and, and of course, that's like, that's like the main point of all this. And, and I think it, it's funny that we reinforce this point through several different characters. We have, we have Crowley and Aziraphale talking, and then we have the idea of Newt and Anathema and Agnes Nutter's book, which said that the world's going to end because the book ends. We assume that this is the end of the world because her prophecies stop at this point. And then, of course, the reveal at the end of the book is that she had predicted this as well and the day after the supposed end of the world is a new book with all these new prophecies so the idea that things have to happen just because they're written down um is contrary to the fact that that you maybe there's another book that you don't know maybe there's another prophecy maybe there's another plan maybe there's something above all this that we can't even understand that we will never understand so trying 
to live according to this grand plan, trying to live according to all of this stuff telling us what we should do, what's going to happen is pointless in the grand scheme of thing. But because by the definition of its ineffability, we cannot understand it. So why do we try? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, this is definitely one of those, one of those classic stories where characters end up wrapped up in prophecy and, and it becomes a question of like, well, if you weren't aware of the prophecy, you wouldn't have done that in the first place. So, right. um, yeah. And I think this next, this next slide, um, go, goes into that. It's a continuation of yours if you want to keep reading, but I can do it if you want. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll just do it. Cause it's just, yeah. Everyone found their eyes turning toward Adam. He seemed to be thinking very carefully. Then he said, I don't see why it matters what is written. Not when it's about people. It can always be crossed out. A breeze swept across the airfield. Overhead, the assembled hosts rippled like a mirage. There was a kind of silence there might have been on the day before creation. Adam stood smiling at the two of them, a small figure perfectly poised exactly between heaven and hell. Crowley grabbed Aziraphale's arm. You know what happened? He hissed excitedly. He was left alone. He grew up human. He's not evil incarnate or good incarnate. He's just a human incarnate. Um, one thing I want to mention before we move on is, is uh, like it was a cool choice the voice actor made was to do Adam's voice in kind of a more low uh, register, uh, the, the way I, like the way I just did it, because I'm basically just ripping off my voices from him. Um, because <laughs> he, he does all the other children with a high like kid voice but he does adam with like a low voice which which makes him seem a little bit foreboding all the time um and yeah. makes you wonder about him a little bit more so I, I like that choice from the voice actor that's cool and there is some and there's some textual hints to that as well there's when when adam gives commands there's uh the game and, and pratchett comment on how he says it in a way that you cannot ignore this command that mm -hmm. he has just a presence in his voice that that's connected to his uh, antichristness um, that 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 commands people with it. So I think that's that's a good call by the the audio book reader to to mm -hmm. interpret it that way. Yeah. So so this is this is it, right? That that what we've been talking about the whole time. This this idea that um, without the influence pushing you to one extreme or another, where people land is when left on their own is somewhere in the middle. We're not good. We're not bad. We're a little of both. Yeah. And and this idea that 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 we without these prophecies, without worrying about these kind of things, that we can just land somewhere in the middle and that can be okay. That 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 you can live a life that is fulfilling in that way. And I, I just I really like I like that idea a lot. That is a very fulfilling idea for me personally. Um and and I just liked I liked that beat. I liked how at like the, the image of Adam standing there between heaven and hell, the idea that like, like the, we keep going back to the, all the heavenly hosts kind of just waiting to fight each other. They're just all up there. Like both armies have been gathered. They're just like in the sky, like looking at this little kid waiting for what he has to say. And it's, yeah. it's a very fulfilling kind of, of end. Yeah. The, isn't there, isn't there a description uh, or, or like, doesn't it say like, you couldn't necessarily tell the hosts of hell apart from the hosts of heaven. Um, yep. Cause yep. they're all, they're all basically the same creatures anyway. And, and when they're getting ready to fight, I mean, it's very much equating the two sides in, in this, in this scene. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're, we're, we're getting into the end of the book now. Um, and the, the next slide we have again, talking about the ineffable plan and this is Crowley kind of working through what it means. Um, and I, I found this wonderful, so I'll read this one. If you sit down and think about it sensibly, you'd come up with some very funny ideas. Like, why make people inquisitive and then put some forbidden fruit where they can see it with a big neon finger flashing on and on and off saying, this is it. I don't remember any neon. Metaphorically, I mean. I mean, why do that if you really don't want them to eat it, eh? I mean, maybe you just want to see how it all turns out. Maybe it's all part of a great, big, ineffable plan. All of it. You, me, him, everything. Some great big test to see if what you've built all works properly, eh? You start thinking, it can't be a great cosmic game of chess. It has to be a very complicated game of solitaire. 
and don't bother to answer. If we could understand, we wouldn't be us, because it's all, all ineffable, said the figure feeding the ducks. Yeah, right. Thanks. So, of course, I love that death is there feeding ducks. Yeah. And answer and listening, overhearing their conversation and li- listening to them. And, right. And this is, I think, this is, this is kind of the thesis statement of the book right here, that we, the idea of multiple sides, the idea of a war between good and evil, the idea of the betrayal, the idea of um, the reason, the battle for the soul of mankind is just kind of made up and it's made up because someone wrote it down in a book one day that it was supposed to happen and that it's all part of one big great plan that none of us can ever understand. And you can interpret that one big great plan as the existence of a higher power of a God. You can like Newt tried to do say it's the universe itself and it's what the rules of the universe, you can interpret anything in that, but, but by definition, you cannot understand it. You don't know. You can't read that book. It's not there for you. You can't rely on it. Yeah. So, you yeah. know. I, I like the idea that that maybe there's not even a book. Like, like, like if it's a game of solitaire, you don't know. You don't know what the next card is going to be that comes up. It's you. You know the rules of the game. Um, I mean, this is a very. Um, I'm probably misusing this word, but but like Kabbalistic. Like it reminds me of the story Unsong, which is a, a recent web serial that's been fairly popular, but it's like, um, it, the, the idea there, and it's, it's a very, it's a very Jewish, uh, theology, uh, slanted way, way of saying it is like, mm-hmm. uh, the, the universe or, or, or God or whatever is like the rules by which things operate, but not necessarily the content of the universe. Um, right. so, so everything is sort of this like fractal organization of how things relate to each other, but that does, doesn't necessarily, imply that the whole story was written down in, in advance. Um, yeah. Well, I like this idea that, that if this is a game of solitaire being played by God, then it's not our game. It's like, it's, we, there's nothing we can do. So we, we like angel, demon, human, uh, witch, witch hunter, like we're all just, cards in this game that belongs to something else that we can't understand so what what how how can we attempt to like pretend like we understand that game that we know what what's going to happen that we know what we should do based on a game that we aren't even part of that we're not even playing yeah yeah I'm, i'm probably reaching with the metaphor here but like a big, a big thing, a big theme of the story is choice. I mean, it, it all comes down to Adam yeah. making a choice and and choosing essentially not to follow through with, with what was written down. Um, and and so like if if we do have free will, then that means that that humans don't just mechanically follow God's plan. So there's the element of randomness. That's why I like solitaire. Is like chess is is a two player game that's deterministic. Solitaire has a random right. element that is not controlled by anyone. So choice comes in maybe in terms of like what what card do you draw next? And, and, and that's yeah. where, that's where the human choice comes in. Yeah. And it, and it fits into the, this idea that God is doing all this because he created this universe. Um, and he wants to see how it works. So he's like, he's playing this game and just, you're absolutely right. If, if you, if you make each card draw a, a choice, like a, a randomized choice of the people of, of the players in your game, then he's just trying to see and and Crowley says it here that is is everything working did this thing that i create it is when 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 put up to the test are all these different pieces in this thing i created functioning in the way they should are they doing what they should are they making the choices that i think they would make are they making the choices that i i wanted them to but you don't want to influence them um mm-hmm. which is kind of exactly what 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 Crowley and Azrafel think that their that their purpose is to influence one way or another, but that's that's all part of that plan. That's all like, are you influencing them the way I want it to? Is is Crowley's love of Earth part of the test that he, by living on Earth, decided, hey, this is a pretty fun place and I want to stay here, um, and and it's just like it gets very very kind of metaphysical and fascinating. Yeah, 
yeah, this this conversation is forcing me to think more deeply about it than I had before, actually, and, and it is fairly complicated met, met, metaphysically. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting. And that's and that's why I think I said <laughs> talking about this book is more fun to me than, <laughs> than reading it because as much as I thought the prose was light and funny, and this paragraph is is funny, it ends on a joke. You have you have death there, <laughs> like feeding ducks while you're having this grand conversation between an angel and a demon, that's funny. It's a funny scene. Um, but there's a lot going on here under the surface. Um, and it's, it makes for a fun thing to talk to it. It, I don't think this conversation would have lasted an hour if we, if we didn't have as much detail into this book to go into. So I think, I think if, if, if the goal of the book is to, uh, encourage these kind of conversations, then bravo, it has succeeded. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think I think we both did enjoy reading it. We were just let down by the ending. I don't know. Yeah, m- m- maybe you didn't enjoy it, but I, I I I would phrase it as I enjoyed reading it, and then I was let down by the ending. But uh, yeah. yeah, like I said, I think I think the, the thematically fulfilling, narratively not so much. Yeah, um, is the is the best way I'd put it. But we yeah. have one last quote here. The fi- one of the final words of the book or final paragraphs of the book. Um, Adam, uh, he couldn't see why people made such a fuss about people eating their silly old fruit anyway, but life would be a lot less fun if they didn't. And there was never an apple in Adam's opinion that wasn't worth the trouble you got into for eating it, which <laughs> is a perfect, like we, like we hinted at earlier in the podcast is a perfect circle completing of the circle from the beginning of the story to the end that this idea that, um, we were inquisitive we were made to be inquisitive because we were always going to eat that damn apple. Like that yeah. was just always going to happen. And like the idea of not being totally evil or not being totally good, but just being a human being who lives somewhere in the middle makes life interesting, makes life fun, makes the world a place worth living in. Yeah. I like that they make, I like that they made Adam a kid because yeah, it, it, it like it emphasizes that the, the kind of playful, childlike wonder of, of humanity and i mean if he were an adult he could still have he could still have wonder and playfulness but it wouldn't quite play as well um um because like by the end you really like adam i i i feel um yeah. which i think is cool because it's like my feelings about him over the course of the story is like at first i was like worried about him i i, I thought he was gonna turn bad and then he kind of does turn bad for a while um, and then there's like the most emotional beat of the whole book for me is where he's kind of succumbing to his to his like demonic nature and, and exerting his power more and more on the world. And his friends are, are like challenging him. And then they're like, well, what if we don't want to do it that way, essentially? And, and he's like, well, I'll just make you do it. And, and he says it without really thinking about it. And then he like recoils in horror because he realizes that like, what's the point of living at all if like you're just pulling the strings on everything and everyone around you. Right. Um, and, uh, that like, that really got to me. Um, and, and at that, that's the moment where he has his, his reversal. That was, that was the single most like successful dramatic beat of the story to me. And, and it, it made me like his character a, a lot actually. Yeah. And I think it's so key as much as we've been complaining about it, it's key that that character choice came from an internal perspective. It wasn't that, an angel or a demon appeared that talked him into making that decision that talked him into that realization. It was just something that happened on the inside of him that he realized that this is not what he wanted. And, and part of that beat is when he's like telling his friends, which countries that they would get to live in, um, where they would get to own. And this adorable beat where he doesn't give anything to himself because all he wants is his little town in England. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that's like his, cause it's a beat that like is kind of brought up a few times and then kind of dropped. They never really come full circle to it, but um, both um, Crowley and, and Aziraphale and, and I think even an Anthema as well say that, that there is a source of love in this town that is clearly Adam and that like the, the, whatever the source is loves this town and mm-hmm. loves it so much and like has this fierce love for this place. And, and that's of course Adam and, and he doesn't want the United Kingdom. He doesn't want Africa. He doesn't want Australia. He doesn't want uh, North America. He wants his town and he just wants his town the way it is. And that's all he wants. And he loves this town. 
He even loves his father. He transforms Satan into his father, um, which is, of course, we didn't even talk about that, but that's a perfect visual representative of making the choice where he rejects one father and chooses his human father. Um, and there's a hint that he, in doing this, when he writes the world, when he sets everything right again, he takes away his own powers. He becomes fully human. Um, yeah. Yeah. So something along those lines, I think. Yeah. 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 So that's, uh, that's good omens. Um, let's talk about the, the TV adaptation real quick because it's relatively recent news. I think it was in August that they announced, um, not only was this happening, but they have, uh, actors for the two lead roles. So Michael Sheen and David Tennant are playing uh, Aziraphale and Crowley. I'm not sure who's playing who. Um, do you know? Um, no, not off the top of my head. Um, I, th- I think I don't know those guys' faces well enough to even to even say, although I, I've seen the pictures. Um, mm-hmm. trying to Google it rapidly. I, mean, I have based a feeling... On, based on what I know about them, I would feel like Michael Sheen would play Aziraphale. Yeah, you just, well, I'm not sure. Sheen will play, yeah, Sheen will play Aziraphale and Tenet will play Crowley, yeah. Okay, all right. And it's a six-part series, six one-hour episodes that's appearing on Amazon streaming. Um, I think this is a good call. I do. I think, you know, American Gods was this thing that I was like, how how, like, how are you going to adapt this? And they did it, and I actually quite liked it. And I think this is more adaptable. I think this works. It's a funny story that uh will 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 work with today's audience yeah and like i was saying earlier on it has a lot of of like natural episodicness to it like like you can see i actually listed yeah. these down like war's backstory um the stories like uh, about how the the book of prophecies from agnes nutter came about yeah. the, the stories about azir fails like bookshop crowley's various adventures and reminiscences newt's life um the, the little interlude where Aziraphale is like swapping bo- bodies between a bunch of people. Um, all these things, like they immediately strike you as like, oh, this would be, if not an episode, this would be like, you know, a, a uh, what's the word, a, a plot line for an episode. Yeah, I, th- I think you're absolutely right. I do. Um, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward. Nicole confirms that, that, that my, that Tenet is, is Crowley. Thanks, okay. Nicole. There's just like a weird delay here. It's, it's tough sometimes. Um, well, it's not a weird delay. It's an intentional streaming delay, but, um, yeah. So do we have anyone out there that has any questions, any comments, anything that they felt that we should have talked about that we didn't? Um, now's your chance to, to make us talk about something that we missed or give us an interpretation that might've, uh, been contrary to what you guys interpreted this book as now's, now's your chance. Um, and because we're we're working on a delay here, Matt, we have to now fill yeah. air while we're waiting I'm for just people gonna, to say things. Just gonna sit here and wait a couple <laughs> minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm actually looking forward to the show. I think. Yeah, I, I am too. I am too. I think those are two fantastic actors. I'm not sure who's show running. I forgot to look at that when I was looking that up. But well, isn't Neil Gaiman like significantly involved? He's he's writing the scripts. Yeah, I think I think okay. he uh, Pratchett like. I think like he's doing it as like he's completing a promise he made to Terry Pratchett before he died, um, saying that he would turn this into something. Because I think Terry Pratchett was working for on a movie for a while, like in the early 2000s, they thought a movie was going to happen. And then um, I think in 2011, it went to show, but then it kind of just floated around for a while and then finally got picked up by Amazon. And now it looks like it's actually happening. So, yeah. Um, is it? Uh, I believe that. um the movie was actually going to be by Terry Gilliam, which would have been, I think you're right. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, so I, I, I don't know. I'm trying to find out when it comes out. So Kiefer says, uh, since this was based in uh, Christian biblical mythos, do you think any other mythology might have been more interesting or given them more flexibility, uh, for a more complete story? Uh, that's, that's something that would take some thinking. Um, yeah, like he, <laughs> you like, have to answer right now, Matt. Well, well, I mean, I can probably, I can just kind of riff. I can be like, well, I mean, you can imagine, like, I don't know exactly that, like, whether like Buddha is supposed to come back or whatever, but like, it would be an interesting story about like, um, y- you can imagine like a, a a reborn, you know, that is kind of the one of the things in Buddhism is like anyone can can become a 
a Buddha. Yeah. Um, but that would be I a think, very different story. <laughs> I think the advantage here is at least towards the um, European and American audiences that this was kind of tailored for the Christian biblical mythology is the most well-known. So you can kind of play with it like, like they did where you don't have to specify certain things. Like we, we play with the four horsemen and we don't specify who they are till way late in the story because you kind of know who they are because you're aware of, of, of the, the, the Christian stories. You're aware of how all that works. Like revelations is something that even people that are not religious, they know revelations, they know about the four horsemen, they know about the antichrist, they know like how this stuff is going to look. So playing in that mythology allows you to, to shortcut a lot of explanations, which is something that Gaiman really likes to do, uh, which you will find out if you read, read American gods, because none of the gods are ever, very few of the gods are ever explicitly explained as which god they're supposed to represent. He loves to keep those cards really close to the chest on that part. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I again, I said this reminded me of Unsong, um, which is which is more about Jewish mythology, and actually, that could also fit really well because in Jewish mythology, the the the, the savior, you know, the Messiah, has not yet come, but when, when he will come, it will be somewhat apocalyptic. So it could almost be, you know, instead of this being the Antichrist, this is the messiah um and and has and that character has to make a choice um and, and i'm pretty sure that the the jewish mythology has a fairly different take on like the nature of evil i i, I don't think it's quite as simple as like oh yeah there's the devil i mean i i mean, I mean they do have the fallen you know they do have lucifer but but yeah. a, a lot of the like trappings of satan and and uh, you know hellfire that have that have built up over time i think those are a lot more uh, related to the Christian side of things. Yeah. I think as far as Kiefer's comment on flexibility, maybe doing another mythos would have given them a little bit more flexibility for the exact opposite of the reason I just said is that a lot of readers are less familiar with a lot of that mythology. So when you have someone less familiar with it, you are more flexible to change stuff in a way that people aren't going to be like, hey, what's going on there? Um, but yeah, That's I, I, think it, I think it would work. I think it would be interesting. And I think, you know, one of the, the things about American Gods that was so surprising to me is how little Christianity by itself is broached in that book. Um, they mostly deal with, you know, I mean, Norse gods are the biggest ones, but they deal mostly with uh, older European uh, types of gods and, and Middle Eastern, but never really. I don't think I think I think Gaiman wrote a Jesus scene and then cut it because I think he was a little terrified of putting Jesus in there, which I, I understand um, I thought there was a mention of Jesus just basically being like a bohemian hippie who just walked around in sandals and and just didn't do much. Maybe I'm thinking yeah. of a different story, but well, I mean, there there is a scene like if you get the tenth anniversary of the book, there's a scene that he cut from the book that he has in the back of it where he runs into Jesus and and he's basically that. The okay. show actually has a very interesting interpretation of Jesus, which is that there's like thousands of them because everyone has their own interpretation of what Jesus is, and there's like a Mexican Jesus, and then there's um, the the traditional uh, Anglo-Saxon looking Jesus that everyone decided he looked like, even though he was definitely a, a Jewish guy, uh, <laughs> but. It, it, it's it's kind of it's kind of very very interesting the show's interpretation of all that thing but Gaiman shied away from it in the book uh, I mean he shied away from Christianity as a whole in the book um, and it, yeah that makes sense like if you're gonna tackle it you have to tackle it right so he right. he just wasn't interested in talking about that in that particular book he was interested in the old world gods right. and, and basically and very, immigrants yeah and it's very possible that he got all that out of his system with this book and he wanted to approach he wanted to move into different different types of gods and different types of religions and deal with their mythologies and, and what those look like when they're transferred to, to our country. But yeah. anyway, that's a complete total tangent. Um, that was a good question. Kifru, anything else? If not, Matt, let's move into the, the, the wrap up. And then okay. if someone has another question, we'll stop and answer it. Um, but we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to talk about next month's book because we're going to be doing this every month. Um, next month's book is the golden compass. So we're going to move from one book about religion to another book <laughs> <laughs> about religion. Um, this is uh, part of the uh, His Dark Materials series by Philip Pullman. Um, normally, we would set this thing out to a vote, but uh, Lupin X 
donated to us at the actual Superman level, which uh, allowed him to uh, get to choose a book for the next month. So he has chosen this book, and um, that's what we're doing. So we will return to our democratic system in October, but right now Lupin is the king, and the king has chosen the Golden Compass. And um, I am very excited about this, Matt. I've read this book before. I know you have not. No, and I've been looking for an excuse to. So, yeah. uh, so thanks for thanks for uh, suggesting this. Yeah, and while this is the first book in a series, um, it is kind of a it, it's it's a good it stops at a good point where it's a satisfying ending. So it's not like we're gonna read and then have nothing to talk about because it's only one part of a story. Um, I think it's gonna be really interesting. We'll talk about that, and I'll make you watch the movie as well because there's a not very good movie. It's okay. Bad. All right. Um, that live stream is tentatively scheduled for October 6th, uh, which is a Friday at 9.30 p.m., so basically the same time we start at this one. Um, that's tentative. We might change it. We might move it around. It depends. Um, cool. Vegeta says that he likes our interpretation of the core theme of free will, contra omniscience, and God's plan, and that it's pretty well supported. Thanks, Vegeta. Um, I, I worry that sometimes I come up with these crazy plans and uh, crazy uh, theme interpretations and people are going to be like actually no you just read that totally wrong and here's a lot of support and i have to go yeah you're bad yeah i mean we we could just like read all of the like essays that have been written about these books but then we don't get the i feel the, like that's the cheating. fun of like figuring it out yeah I, I agree oh but vegeta says that uh, when he first read the book he interpreted in the opposite way namely due to the ineffable nature of the ineffable plan trying dot 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 Cheetah, what's the next? Ah. <laughs> to fight or serve the plan will basically be pointless, not because you can't know the plan, but because the plan of an omnipotent, omniscient being would necessarily include whatever you did, because otherwise he wouldn't have made you in such a way that you would choose to do what you did. That's very true. And that's 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 I think that goes back to that whole battle between a plan and free will, in that if if everything is part of this ineffable game of solitaire of God's does free will exist yeah can it exist right yeah that's um that's the and i think the book intentionally does not take a firm side on on whether because here's the thing if if all of agnes nutter's prophecies are perfectly accurate which they are then that's like a strong indication that free will doesn't exist um but 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 yet adam makes his choice that breaks that mold And, and you could also argue that the only you know yeah, I don't know. There's a difference between seeing the future and, um, like, I mean, it, it, you don't you don't know what kind of future site is it? Like, is it a kind of future site where you could mess up her future site if you, if you, you know, if could Anathema have like figured out what was supposed to happen and then made it not happen? You know, I, I don't yeah, like yeah. They, they never quite do that experiment, and then Adam does in fact break the, uh, you know, the prophecy. So right, right. Well, and there's, I mean, there's the idea that there's another book that, yeah. that, that I like the idea that no matter what happens, there's always another book and there's always, there's always another plan. There's always another thing that is going to happen. It's definitely going to happen. So you have to live according to it. And I think is that the, the whole anathema new part of the story is, do you want to live that way? Mm-hmm. If, if, if this stuff is going to happen do you want to do you want your life to be defined by trying to follow what is going to happen or do you just want to live your life do you just want to enjoy life do you just want to burn that book and be happy and the the answer for those characters at least is yes that's that's what we choose mm-hmm. and i like that I yeah like it a lot yeah me too yeah, that was, a, that was a great comment, Vegeta. Thank you. Kifru, thank you so much. Nicole, thank you. Uh, whoever else is in here, thank you guys so much. This was a lot of fun. Um, I'm sorry for all, like, the, I, I think nothing major went wrong, which is great, <laughs> but um, I think it was still a little a little bumpy as we try to figure out this new format. We've never done live streaming like this before, so um, I probably didn't look at the camera as much as I was supposed to. I put Matt's face right under the camera, so... When I look at him when I'm talking, hopefully you guys think I'm looking at you. Um, but but yeah, we're going to keep doing this. We're going to do it next month and the month after, and, and, and we're going to keep going. So hopefully uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Um, Matt, you have something that I wrote for you to say, so do that. Am I supposed to say, um, 
if you like what we do here at yes, the daily planet yes, <laughs> and want to see more of it head on over <laughs> to our patreon patreon.com slash daily planet films and consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford uh, you'll get access to our private discord server as well as the ability to vote for which book we cover once lupin has abdicated his power uh, and you'll get tons of other cool benefits the the discord server is is pretty fun there's a lot of activity activity over there so uh, really uh, yeah. encourage that I'm very pleasantly surprised by that. I think we had a small conversation last week where I was like, hey, we can add a Discord and it's free and, and people would maybe enjoy talking and we could build a community. And you were like, no, let's not do that. That's a terrible <laughs> idea. No, that didn't That's happen. not how I remember it, but I'm sure you're right. <laughs> no, but so we just threw it in there and, and I've been very happy with the response. I like the conversations going on in there. It's really great. So um, if, you are, if you are not a patron just yet and, uh, and, and want to join in on that, it's there for you. Um, if you have any other questions or comments or just want to reach out to us and talk to us about this book, any other books that you want us to do in the future, um, you can reach us on Twitter at Daily Planet Films or email us at dailyplanetfilms at gmail.com. That's, that's it for us this week. Thanks. Thanks so much, guys. Matt, that was a lot of fun. And we'll see you next month for the next edition of the Daily Planet Book Club when we read The Golden Compass or Northern Lights if you're from the United Kingdom. Hooray. All we right. Did we did it. We did it. Everyone. We already thanked everyone, but thanks again off off air. Yeah, we're now not recording anymore. So thank you when I don't have to yeah, worry about editing. Genuinely this time, thank you. Yeah, we were just faking it last time. Yeah. Thank you this time. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was that was a lot of fun, guys. Um thank you for those of you that participated in chat. Um Hopefully we'll get some more people in here. We kind of scheduled this one very last minute because we were, our days are so busy right now and we're trying to fit these stuff in, but we've got this one on the calendar already. So we're going to have plenty of time to tell people and hopefully, hopefully they can make it. Um, if Friday nights aren't the best for some of y'all email us or, or let us know and we can find another time. It's just, we have so many other shows and stuff we're working on all the time. So it's uh, it's hard to find time for this kind of stuff. Yeah. I think we, between the two of us, we have something podcast related almost every day of the week. <laughs> yeah. Like, like seriously, like I have yeah. this and then I have another thing tomorrow and then another thing on Sunday, which is not even daily planet related. So, yeah, yeah, we do have a lot of stuff, but it's all for you guys. It's all for you. Um, yeah. So that's, that's it for us. Thanks so much. Um, if you, if you want to listen to, uh, the podcast version of this should be up sometime tomorrow, I think is my plan. Um, but you've already listened to it, so you don't have to do that. Matt is a bit louder than Scott. All right. I'm sorry. I hope that's not true on the podcast itself. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, was there any, like, how was the, how was the audio lag? Because I put in a, a thing there that was supposed to clean that up. Oh, and we forgot to say this on the recording. This doesn't matter, but um, if you are a patron, we are going to stream our recording sessions for the Worm podcast uh, when we do those. We're not going to do it every week, but I think we are going to do it Monday because we'll be recording Monday, our, our mailbag episode. So if you're a patron, uh, we will be throwing that link. What was that? I'm testing the feed delay. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Uh, yes, if if you are a patron um, and want to join that, we're gonna throw the link to that in the Patreon, or in the Discord and the Patreon on Monday evening. So um, you can join us there. We will probably ignore you. We will not be answering your questions and stuff during the stream like this. But uh, we usually talk to people before and after. We I say usually. We did it one time, <laughs> and so now it's a usually. Yeah. All right. Well. It's Friday night. It's 11 o'clock, and my wife has been asleep for like three hours. So, I think I have a kid awake Sorry. downstairs, so I'm going to go oh, address that. That's fun. Yeah. Oh, no, Jake. I'm oh, sorry. no. Well, luckily, it's all there. So Yeah, it's all still there. You can just, just rewind it. Pretend it's live. I, I think that works. Except we won't respond to you. That's true. Sorry. Thanks, Jake. Um, yeah. So... I think we're going to go now. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Have a good Friday night. Yeah, and uh, we'll talk to those of you that listen to the other podcasts when those happen. (laughs) 
Yeah. Bye. Bye.